Um, we're going to start off with the Giving Grove presentation. So Matt is here to um, give some basic information about adding fruit to your community garden. Then we're going to move on to a panel discussion. So these are um, fellow community partner garden coordinators um, who are here to just share thoughts and experience. And then we're going to open it up to a Q&A with the audience as well. Um, and then lastly, and very importantly, we have a Wheel of Names raffle. So five lucky attendees today will get some free KCCG swag, t-shirts, tumblers, more. So um, stick around till the end for that. So again, please remain muted. Having your camera on is optional. Um, during the Giving Grove presentation, we're gonna ask that nobody unmute themselves for questions. So just type it into the chat. Um, and we've got some folks on the chat here to um, answer those questions. And then any unanswered questions will pose to Matt at the end, um, or they will be emailed to him at the end. So I'm gonna take it away for Giving Grove. So Matt, just a reminder, just let me know when you need me to switch slides for you. So here um, is Matt Bunch, who's the horticulturist with the Giving Grove um, presenting today. All right, uh, thank you, Anna, and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, this morning. It's below freezing, so we might as well be inside. Uh, so uh, many of you, uh, just looking at the, the number of attendees, uh, you actually already have uh, Giving Groves uh, with your community partner garden. So some of this you already know a little bit about. Um, about our organization. Uh, I, was it the previous slide, Anna, that uh, showed all of our photos uh, with the organization? Yes, there we go. Just uh, so uh, uh, we have Rob Ryman, who he's the executive director, and he actually is executive director of the Giving Grove uh, Inc., which is the national organization. Um, here locally, uh, we have myself, the horticulturist. Uh, Melinda Dillon is community engagement. So if you uh, have any questions on how to get the neighborhood engaged or uh, kind of what to do with your produce, uh, uh, she's a great resource. She's also on the call. And then there's Carter, and he is the Carter of all trades, kind of uh, uh, does a little bit of, uh, of everything with uh, the Giving Grove. So um, that's the team. And let's go ahead and uh, change the slide. Uh, this slide just kind of represents, you know, we are all throughout the Metro. Uh, so we, we work uh, with a lot of community partner gardens. We work with a lot of schools and we just have some standalone orchards out there in the community. Uh, next slide. So, Basically, for those of you who are not uh, uh, versed on what we uh, do and what we provide, so let's say you are a community partner garden and you're thinking about uh, going beyond vegetables, uh, going beyond the annual crops and looking at uh, perennial crops, looking at fruit crops, uh, uh, specifically trees and berries. Uh, so uh, what, what we will do is we will provide a site, site assessment. Um, you know, just, just like vegetables, fruits require full sun. Um, uh, uh, fruits also require good airflow. So we, um, uh, we, we would meet with you and decide, well, okay, so you have 2,000 square feet of, of open area that is, gets eight hours of sun. That, if we planted trees there would not be shading out your vegetables. Uh, so it looks like, yes, looks like it'd be a great place for a giving grow. We, uh, we uh, then will drop a blueprint uh, for you and, and with you kind of discussing the different fruits that you'd want to have in the garden. Uh, we provide access to low cost plant materials. Now this goes beyond sort of the individual sales of fruit trees uh, that, that we do every year with Kansas City Community Gardens, but we have a rather extensive uh, fruit and nut plant list of varieties that we'll make available for giving grove sites. Um, and then we will help with the planting. Uh, so that's uh, that's really one of those, uh, you know, the community gets all involved. It's 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 really great to, to be out there and planting trees with uh, with 30 of your 
friends and community members. Uh, so it, it's really a good, a good team building, community building uh, exercise. Uh, then what we offer beyond that, uh, once the trees are in the ground, we have workshops. And those workshops, uh, eight to nine uh, different topics per year. And, and I'll show you a list a little bit later. Uh, we have access to orchard supplies. So we do offer some uh, supplies initially for free. And, uh, but then we have tools available for loan, uh, not only here at the, the community garden shop, but we also have a tool library. Uh, and, and then access to volunteer help. So, so let's say you don't already have an existing base of volunteers with your community garden or orchard, we can definitely uh, find those volunteers for you. And then lastly, uh, funding. And, and uh, sometimes we have specific funding available for smaller orchards and organizations. You can go ahead and, okay. Uh, the, the thing is, and, and those of you who, who run a community garden, you probably already know that, uh, that having a water source is, is an absolute must. And, and so uh, we also work with uh, the CPG team occasionally uh, on the KC Grow Grant to try to get water to the orchards uh, or the, the proposed orchards. Uh, at least two committed people are also needed. Um, so, uh, you know, trees, I mean, trees and uh, fruit trees and vegetables, of course, you know, these, these take, these take work, um, but really having a good two to four people, uh, out there responsible for the orchard is ideal. Uh, just having one person out there to water 10 to 15 trees once a week, well, sometimes leave that one person, mm, you know, they, they might feel like they're, they're the one hauling all the water, if you will. So uh, having, having a number of people involved in the orchard is great. Uh, and then uh, being willing to continually care and monitor for the orchard. Um, it is, uh, you know, being a perennial crop, uh, these plants will live 15 to 20 to 30 years. Now realizing that not everybody wants to sign up for that long of a time for the orchard, uh, but, but you also would need to think about a succession plan for the orchard too. So the more people you get involved and really the more generations you get involved with the orchard, the better. Um, you know, get, this is a good way to get the, the younger generations involved. They, they see the trees go into the ground and then 10 years later, they're actually helping maintain those trees. Uh, attendance to workshops, uh, this is strongly encouraged. And like I say, we have a number of those workshops. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the, the produce is donated. This is one of these things where um, really a commitment that the produce will go to, it could go to the neighborhood. Um, it, it can go back into the community, uh, but if, if the community is not necessarily uh, in need, then some of the produce should be donated to those in need. Uh, next slide. So this is just an example of a planting plan, and um, this happens to be at a school. So uh, we like I say, we, we work with a lot of schools, a lot of community partner gardens. Um, so this is, is actually what I would call a, a maybe medium-sized orchard. Most of the orchards that we uh, plant, uh, they're going to be uh, around a 10 to 15 tree orchard. Uh, we, we will plant uh, as small as a five tree orchard. Um, but this one happens to be a larger one. There are, there are two people that uh, uh, serve as the stewards of this orchard. And basically you'll see, uh, we, we end up planting a lot of apples, pears, Asian pears. Uh, we love blackberries. Uh, blackberries are nice because they'll actually provide a crop a little bit earlier uh, than these fruit trees. 
uh, fruit trees, you're looking at a good three to four years. And in some cases, you're looking at seven years before you actually get into full production. Now, what I mean by full production is that's something that's going to be 150 to 250 pounds per tree. Now, that, that starts to actually look like serious produce uh, when, you're, when you're seven to eight years in. So it's, it's another reason uh, with these perennial fruit crops to, to really be planning for the future. Uh, let's go ahead and do the next slide here. So uh, uh, back to some of the things that we, we offer. Um, so you see planting day assistance, that's the day of. We are out there digging the holes with you, planting the trees with you. Like I say, it's a, it, it, it's a good time for as, as a good of a time as digging a hole can be. Um, and then uh, we offer uh, numerous workshops. So this happens to be a photo from a summer pruning workshop. Uh, so we, we do uh, dormant season pruning, we do summer pruning. And we will have multiples of those, and, and we oftentimes will do those uh, at, at some of our uh, partner orchard sites. So this happens to be at Turtle Hill over in uh, Kansas City, Kansas. And actually in the background, you will see our tool library, uh, which uh, if, if you are a Giving Grove site, you do have access to that tool library. Now go ahead and next slide. So a little bit about our uh, Giving Grove workshops. Um, and, and for those of you who are Giving Groves, uh, I would invite you to uh, sign up for these workshops. I believe uh, we, have, we have sent that. Well, we have sent out the links for those with the, the workshop calendar. Uh, so uh, we, we have an Engaging Your Community workshops in January and June. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, we promote with the Giving Grove is a holistic spray, uh, a fruit tree spray regimen. And this is something that is uh, a little bit unique to our program, but basically this is uh, a biological uh, spray program. So it's not a harsh chemical spray, which, with, uh, which a lot of fruit trees, uh, they, the fruit trees are sprayed a lot. <laughs> if you can believe that. And so we teach this holistic spray uh, pest management. We also have a separate pest identification and management workshop. Uh, then we lead a whole bunch of, of uh, dormant pruning workshops because really uh, this time of year between late January and early March, it is the time to get out in your orchard and do uh, do that pruning on your trees. Uh, our Orchard Basics workshop is, is very much uh, kind of looking at the trees and how to manage them, uh, seeing the different leaf spots, uh, knowing how to, how to spread limbs, uh, understanding how the tree grows. Uh, for, for some people, um, trees are a whole different beast than, than vegetables and, and and they're not comfortable with, uh, with what's going on on the tree. So Orchard Basics is very much uh, how, to, how to become a little bit more comfortable with your tree. Uh, we have a preparing for harvest, which kind of takes into account everything you need to know prior to and up to the day of harvest. Our Orchard Biodiversity just talks about uh, the orchard floor um, uh, managing uh, ground covers, managing other plants. Uh, it's, it's very much a, a niche course. And then uh, uh, coming up uh, this year, we are going to be doing some preserving the harvest workshops, which so this will, this will be talking about uh, canning and, and um, uh, making, making jams and jellies, as well as even best practices around freezing. Uh, believe it or not, yes, it's not just you cut it up and put it in the freezer. You know, there's there's some nuances to some of these uh, some of these fruit items uh, to freezing and dehydrating. And then lastly, we have the summer pruning again, and that's typically done in August. 
for for new Given Grove sites, sites that uh, are are like we have our planting seasons here coming up in uh, in March to May. For those new Given Grove sites, we do also have a new steward training workshop, and that basically tells you everything you need to know about planting trees and the Giving Grove program. So it's, a, it's an introduction to our program and planting trees. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the things that we uh, provide. Uh, so we provide a Giving Grove handbook and uh, this is incredibly helpful. So this is a, a binder, a hardcover binder that you can have uh, in your tool shed right by the orchard. Uh, this has many things like spray calendars, holistic spray calendars, um, ripening charts. Uh, it has information on all of the varieties. So it's, it's really a wealth of knowledge. Um, we also have the Holistic Orchard book, and that is uh, by the author Michael Phillips, who he is an apple grower up in the Northeast. And, and that's uh, what we have, have based our holistic spray regimen on is, is his, his book. Um, a five gallon bucket, what would you do without that? Uh, so um, we also provide starter hand pruners because we found that hand pruners are one of the things that uh, uh, most of our sites are confused about. And so if we set you up with at least a starter pair, um, we know that, that you'll be at least pruning. Uh, weeding tools, limb spreaders, mulch. We do make uh, wood chip mulch available for free. And that's a, another perk of our program. And then holistic spray ingredients. Uh, as I've referenced this holistic spray many times, we make those spray ingredients for free as well. Basically what a Giving Grove site needs other than the labor, uh, the, the manpower, the people power uh, would be watering supplies, uh, a sprayer, because eventually, uh, maybe not the first year, but definitely the, the second year on having a sprayer, a pump sprayer, two gallon or four gallon sprayer uh, will be very necessary because the, the trees well need to be sprayed. Uh, there are just too many fruit pests out there uh, to not spray the trees. Um, you know, I mean, sure, you can tolerate a little bit of fruit damage, but when all of the fruits get uh, in, infested with something like codling moth, uh, then it, it doesn't become worth growing the tree. So uh, we also make uh, organic uh, pesticides available, uh, just like at, at the storefront for Kansas City Community Gardens. And um, uh, pruning saws. Uh, so that's something that definitely all sites will need as the, as the trees get older. And then uh, chicken manure fertilizer, and that's the fertilizer you know for your vegetables. Uh, that also gets used on, on the trees as well. So next slide. And these are just some of the things that we have available for sites to borrow. Uh, we do, uh, so you'll see, you'll see the ladder right here. Uh, uh, so we make these orchard ladders available to borrow, not only at our shop, but uh, the tool library as well. And every year we do a purchase of these orchard ladders. They're not the cheapest things in the world. They're, they run about 300 to $400, but definitely if you have a larger orchard, it is worth the investment. Um, we also allow our cider press to go uh, off site. So if you're planning a harvest celebration, uh, you can you can borrow our cider press and have an old timey cider pressing and and it's a lot of fun, you know, but it is a lot of work, I will tell you. And then some of these other things, uh, uh, pole pickers, wheelbarrows, etc. Uh, so we we make all of these things available to borrow. Go ahead and, and next slide. So uh, for, for those of you um, who 
you know, want to grow fruit, but it does look like too much work, uh, which it sometimes can be, or you don't have the space, uh, you may want to consider uh, some of these other fruits and, and you, you don't have to be a part of the, the Giving Grove uh, uh, organization. You don't, you don't have to sign up and enroll with us, but you can, you can still plant these and grow these. And, and strawberries, uh, I think you know, some, some sites do have strawberries. Uh, I, I think strawberries are ideal for raised beds, not for in ground. Um, uh, for one, uh, you want to make sure that the strawberries are raised up so you're not having to bend over too far every time. Uh, so we do offer the Cavendish, which is a June bearing strawberry. Uh, the Eversweet, which is an ever bearer, we should have uh, some of those uh, later on this, this spring. Raspberries, I will say, are probably a good no-brainer for uh, just most community gardens. Now, the way I view raspberries is they're more like a treat when you're out in the garden. Uh, it's, uh, they, they never really make it into the kitchen. So they're there for the gardeners to just enjoy, but they're very easy to maintain. You harvest from, from basically late July until our first hard freeze, and then you cut the plants down. Uh, then they'll regrow and the cycle repeats. Uh, blackberries are a little bit more nuanced and I would suggest if you really want to get into growing uh, a large number of blackberries, uh, a number of linear feet, uh, that you do reach out to us because blackberries do require a trellis system and knowledge on pruning. So this is something uh, that we, we have set up these trellises uh, over the years and really have some good best management practices uh, around blackberries. But blackberries can be incredibly rewarding and they also have a little bit longer shelf life than raspberries. And lastly, there are bush cherries. And uh, these are very easy to grow and are productive too. Uh, these can be purchased through the individual fruit tree order. Uh, but if you are considering uh, a large number of these, uh, we do have more varieties of them and, and we can uh, really work with you to get uh, to uh, in, increase those numbers in your community garden. And so, um, if, if you do have any additional uh, questions or would be, uh, if you would like to start uh, one of these orchards, you can contact Melinda uh, if you are interested. And I think, is that the end here? Are we, are we done? Um, you are done, yes. Okay, Unless you've so got anything are, else you'd like to add. Well, are, are there, uh, so I saw there were some questions in the chat. Uh, were there any that did not go answered? Let's see here. Um, it looks like Carter got to Rebecca about um, permeable surface question, setting up a site visit for that. Um, Nancy Chapman just recommends having a rechargeable electric sprayer, cut spray time down. Yeah, um, and, and I, I, I will second that and thank you, Nancy, uh, because as, especially if you have a, a, I would say 10 tree plus orchard. Um, so uh, there, there are the standard uh, hand pump backpack sprayers, which they work fine. But uh, yeah, I was converted a couple years ago when we purchased a, a rechargeable uh, backpack sprayer and it definitely cuts the spray time down. Uh, it also uh, cuts the amount of physical exertion from just uh, hand pumping the sprayer all the time. And you, you actually have a greater reach uh, with, the, uh, with the battery powered sprayer. You can get 12 to 15 feet up in the tree without a problem, which, which can be a problem with a, a manual hand pump sprayer. And yeah, just to encourage anybody else who's got some questions, please throw it in the chat right now. Um, Whitney with Pendleton Heights said that bush cherries are a great fun um, choice for kids, easy to pick. It's a favorite in their orchard over there. 
Yeah, the the yeah the thing about bush cherries is they don't get very tall. They they will get seven feet tall, really, kind of the tallest, and so it does make it. You're not up on a ladder picking cherries, uh, and so it is a great activity for the kids. Uh, you have kids associated with your community garden. Bush cherries are a must, and and I've yet to meet a uh, a kid uh, that doesn't like something that's tart and sour. Okay, so how far from walnut trees can you plant fruit trees? So uh, as long as the walnut tree is not shading out the fruit tree. Um, so I think by, by saying walnut tree, I think you're, you're referencing the juglone that, uh, that walnuts uh, actually in the, not only in the foliage and the nuts and the roots. So juglone is the chemical that walnuts release into the soil, which actually makes it difficult to grow other tree crops, or excuse me, other crops. So uh, uh, crops in the tomato family, the solanaceous crops, so tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, and also crops in the bean family, uh, they do not grow well around juglone, around walnut trees. However, most of the fruit trees, they're in the rose family, not a problem. So, um, you know, walnuts and fruit trees, they, they can cohabitate just fine. Um, and a question right before that um, from Riley, if the designated land steward is lacking an apprentice, is it sufficient to have a group of dedicated volunteers to fill the secondary role? Uh, I think if, if, yeah, certainly. I think if you have dedicated volunteers, um, I and these are these are folks that have, have really signed up for the cause. I think that's just fine. You know, a the the term apprentice apprentice can mean a group of people really. And so, if there are dedicated volunteers, I think that that sounds sounds like you have a group. Great. And yeah, questions are flowing in now. So from Julie, is there a variety of raspberry you recommend? Do you recommend a raised bed to contain them? Yeah, so uh, we used to recommend the heritage raspberry and uh, but then uh, uh, we found the Caroline raspberry and Caroline is what's called a primocane raspberry, meaning it starts growing in March and then it puts on fruit by the end of the year. So by, by July on to uh, first hard freeze in October. So they have a really long window of, of ripe fruit. Uh, Caroline is the one that, uh, that we recommend and that's the one that we also uh, sell. Um, and I, I do kind of recommend a raised bed to contain them because raspberries run, they, they will, they'll, they'll just keep going. And the raised bed does help contain them. And also if, if you have somebody that's mowing, uh, they can see the lines of the raised bed and, and not worry about, oh, I'm, I'm mowing through this when I shouldn't be. Um, so, yeah. Great. And then um, Thomas asks, what spray should I use on my apple trees while they're still dormant? Right, so well, that is a, that's a, a dormant oil spray. And so actually there, there are many different, um, many different brands of dormant oil out there. Uh, any more, uh, there's, so there's horticultural oil which is actually recommended more now. Dormant oil used to be a different formulation. Horticultural oil, it's the same thing. It's, it's a lighter formulation. Uh, but yeah, that's something that uh, really probably about mid-February, uh, mid to late February is the perfect time to apply dormant oil there. Great. Um, and yeah, and folks, we still have 10 minutes. So if you have questions, bring them in. Anything we don't get to, we'll send to Matt later and we'll um, email them out um, to you all afterward, um, as well as the presentation and all of that. So um, uh, there's, there's a lot coming in. Here yeah, so this is great. This is the time you got, you got yeah, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> certainly, certainly. So, okay, we got the, okay. So now I'm at Sarah, looks yeah. like. Mm -hmm. yeah. So have native hazelnut shrubs. They produce small nuts. How do you process to eat? Yeah. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, that, so, you know, that's, uh, that's a labor of love there, Sarah, because yes, the, the native hazelnuts, they do produce nuts, but they are small nuts. And so you, you have to basically, uh, I think mainly you would have to get a, a hand, just a hand nutcracker. Now, the thing is, you know, these hazelnuts, once you have the shell off of them, they have that little paper thin husk. Um, and that paper thin husk, while it is edible, you know, it kind of gets stuck in your teeth and, and is a little bit problematic. What I've found is during the roasting process on hazelnuts, so let's say you put them in a, in a, in a dry skillet, and you do a dry roast on them, that husk falls right off. Another thing you can also do is when you have the hazelnuts out of their shell, you can kind of put them in a paper bag or something and apply some sort of rub, rub the uh, paper bag and press down and that will help remove that little papery thin husk. Um, there are a number of cultivated varieties of hazelnuts that produce larger nuts. However, even those larger nuts, it's still kind of a, a, a problem. So Jill, um, address what steps new orchards should be taken out as far as sprays and fertilizers. So um, first off, Jill, I want to make sure that you're, you're getting our newsletter. Uh, and, and if you're not, maybe, maybe let Melinda know in the chat. Uh, but uh, because we, we have sent out some uh, information as far as, as some of this. Now you do have a, a new orchard. And so yes, you will be wanting to fertilize your trees uh, this basically this time of year. So February, early March, uh, we do have the chicken manure available. And that's something that you can come and pick up. It's, uh, it's basically it's $5 for a five gallon bucket. Five gallon bucket uh, is roughly about 32 pounds. So if you're, you're you should be applying uh, roughly a pound per tree on your young trees right now. So, and as far as sprays, I would recommend a dormant oil spray for you, Jill. Your, your trees are, are very young. You won't be getting into the holistic spray regimen quite yet, but a dormant oil spray would be good uh, for some of the mites and other small pests that, that can affect the, uh, the foliage and the growth uh, of, of your trees going into the, to this growing season. And Carter linked um, the spray that you all use in the chat as well. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Carter. Uh, when do we prune bush cherries, Tony Gatlin? Well, uh, when the weather uh, is above freezing this time of year, uh, and uh, do we, first off. Uh, yeah, so we prune them a little bit, and that's something, uh, bush cherries are pretty maintenance-free, but they do they're a multi-trunked, uh, very, very thick growing shrub. And so what we end up doing, just like any pruning, we'll, we'll remove some of the rubbing and crossing branches, not to the point where nothing touches, but we'll, we'll remove some of those. And sometimes we'll move, remove some of the larger trunks. And when I say larger, I'm talking maybe three quarters to one inch diameter trunks that are growing up in the middle of the shrub. That just thins it out a little bit. Um, and thinning it out allows for more sunlight. It allows for more airflow. It, it allows for a healthier fruit crop. After how many years do you recommend replacing strawberries? Yeah, boy, that's... Uh, <laughs> That I guess that's a little bit dependent upon the variety of strawberries, but most of the time, if, if you have the ever bearing, which are the ones that uh, bear three, have three crops a year, those get replaced uh, every couple of years. Now, as far as the June bearing, the, the ones that bear once a year and, and kind of late May, early June, uh, we actually don't recommend replacing them. However, uh, we recommend rejuvenating them. And rejuvenation is, is something that basically requires removing the older mother plants. 
So, uh, or even grandmother plants, if you will. So the mother plants are the ones that they form the daughter plants, which are, if you've seen how strawberries grow, they send out a runner, another plant gets established. So you remove the old plants and let the daughter plants take over. And this rejuvenation happens really every couple of years. What else do we have? Um, we've got a question from Riley. Do you recommend periodically running chickens beneath fruit trees for fertilizing and pest control purposes? Yeah, so actually now is a really good time to run chickens beneath your fruit trees. And the reason being there, uh, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of the fruit pests, they actually overwinter in that, uh, we'll call it the duff layer uh, beneath the trees. And if you were to sprinkle, let's say, just a little bit of chicken food, a little bit of bird seed right below your trees, for one, the chickens will go there instantly. And then the chickens will do what they do best. They'll start scratching, they'll start pecking. And in that scratching and pecking, they'll end up pulling up larvae of codling moth. They'll end up pulling, actually, the pupa stages, excuse me, not larvae. I wanna, wanna, <laughs> don't want to get emails about this. Um, but, uh, and, and so they'll start finding those uh, in that little little half inch to inch uh, layer of soil. Uh, so now is a great time to be doing that. And as far as the fertilizing, uh, yeah, I mean, now is fine because if the, if the chicken poop is uh, freshly applied, we'll say right now, uh, there's, there's, there's not really a risk of things being burned. Um, I would not have the chickens run through the orchard during the growing season, however. Um, what I found with this is sometimes the chickens will actually start roosting in the trees and then that leads to, you know, poop on the branches, they're pecking apples, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, would, I would leave them out of the orchard then. Um, Sarah asked a question that Carter actually answered, how much chicken manure fertilizer should be used on raspberries? And Carter says one to two pounds per 10 linear feet. Yes. Um, and Sarah also asks, what ground cover plants do you recommend for around slash under the orchard trees? Yeah, so that's, I feel like that's a, a much longer conversation that we'll probably have to have to take a, an email uh, to answer. Um, in general, and this, this would be for, for one who is not too much of a gardener, uh, we just recommend having a good mulch layer, a good wood chip mulch layer around the trees. Uh, as far as other ground cover plants, um, that's, Sarah, let's take that one offline. <laughs> That sounds good. That's actually the last question, um, which is right on time here. So thank you everyone for tuning in for the Giving Grove. Again, if you have questions about starting a Giving Grove or adding to your Giving Grove, um, contact Melinda. Um, fruit is going on sale pretty soon here. So if your uh, garden wants to add fruit and you're not currently a Giving Grove, get in contact with them um, and we can go from there. So thank you, Matt, so much. And we're going to go ahead and move on to our, our panel here. All right. Thank you. And then just one last clarification point. So a lot of folks, um, just clarification between the two programs. So we're all under the umbrella of Kansas City Community Gardens, but the Community Partner Gardens program um, works primarily with the vegetable garden side and the Giving Grove is the fruit side. So um, oftentimes we get that question or people are like, I think I just filled out an application. So there's two different member applications. <laughs> You're getting two different newsletters but we all work together so we can easily pass your questions on to the other program. So just in case anybody had questions about that. So thank you so much, Matt. Yep, thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and move on to the panel. Um, so we are lucky enough to have um, five different panelists join us today. So um, everybody here is involved in a community garden somehow. And so, Really, the theme of today's event is just peer support, how we can support each other. Um, 
that again, that was something that came up a lot in the survey. We had quite a few people request to just hear from each other, hear what other people are doing. Um, do people have tips and tricks that they are not doing in their garden? Or if you just need some affirmation that you're doing a great job and doing what other folks are doing, um, all of it is very valuable. So um, this panel will go a little bit differently than the Giving Grove presentation. So um, again, keep yourself on mute. Having your camera on is optional. The way that the panel, um, we're going to do it here today is it's broken up into three parts. We're gonna do some rapid fire questions to get everyone warmed up. So it's just the panel answering those. Uh, we're going to have a fishbowl discussion. So what that looks like is just us sort of watching the natural conversation that comes about. Um, I'll be prompting questions to the group. And um, the idea there is that a lot of things are gonna come up that I think would naturally come up at a Q and A. And so just letting people sort of talk through it and talk through what's worked, what hasn't worked at their community garden. And then lastly, we will have time for the audience Q and A. Um, so we do want some interaction. It's hard to do it over Zoom, of course, but so we're gonna try here today. Um, and we're gonna give you more instructions when that time comes. So it's not yet, but essentially once that time comes, you'll be using the raise your hand feature, which if you kind of hover your mouse down at your bar down here on Zoom, you'll see reactions and then raise hand and it will put a little hand up in the corner. And then we're gonna call on you. You're gonna unmute yourself, ask your question and then mute yourself back again. So we're gonna ask people to keep their questions or comments to about 20 seconds or less. So again, I will give you all of that. Good job, Jeff, good job. <laughs> Um, we'll give you all of those descriptions again once the time comes, um, but for now it's just the panel. Um, and then again, you can type any questions into the chat too, and if you can say that for the Q&A section too, so we can stay organized with your questions, that would be great. Okay, so our panelists today, I'm actually going to go ahead and stop sharing so we can see our panelists. And give us one second while we spotlight our folks today, Amanda's going to help me spotlight and we're going to confirm with you all that you can actually see our panelists too. I see Reggie. We've got Whitney. <laughs> this is a new feature in Zoom that we're excited to use so bear with us if it gets weird. <laughs> all right we got Matt. Jeff, I think we're missing Julie. And there she is, all right. Okay, if the people can just sort of in their screen, give a thumbs up if you can see the panelists highlighted here on your screen. All right, that is looking good. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna go around and introduce you all since we'll have lots of time to discuss after that. But um, first here in your window, you've got Reggie. Reggie's with the Righteous Roots Community Garden um, in Kansas City, Kansas. Thanks for being here. We've got Whitney with the Pendleton Heights Community Garden. She's in the historic Northeast in KC Mo. We've got Matt slash Ngozi, who looks like he's driving. So this is cool to see. <laughs> so he is with uh, the Haley House Youth Garden um, with the Jackson Family Court, Jackson County Family Court. We've got Jeff um, with the Reverend Sharon Garfield Memorial Garden in the historic Northeast, also in KC Mo. And then Julie with God's Garden at Colonial Presbyterian in Overland Park, Kansas. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, we're very excited. So um, we're going to start with the rapid fire. So again, I'm going to prompt questions to you. I'm going to call on your name right now. We're sort of warming ourselves up here. Um, I may or may not interrupt at some point just so we can um, make sure we get some more questions into and get the conversation rolling. Um, so first question here, I'm going to start with you, Reggie. If you could only grow one thing, what would you grow? <laughs> Keep it to one word or one sentence. <laughs> Red okra. Red okra. All right, Whitney. Uh, morel mushrooms. If I could grow them, I would do it. <laughs> okay. Okay, Matt. Fell in love with ground cherry since day one. A good choice. Very interesting, Julie. I'd have to say spinach. Spinach, all right. And I feel like we lost Jeff here on the spotlight, but Jeff, if you're there, unmute yourself and there we go. Uh, <clears throat> I unfortunately have um, a very poor network where I'm located right now. So 
That's that's first, okay. Jump that's in the and first out. one for my <laughs> virtual experiences having that no problem. out on me. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, your question was something about what would I grow? Yeah, if you could only grow one thing, what would you grow? Uh, well, it's kind of silly, but pumpkins. All right, I like it. Okay, all right. Um, Reggie, did you get um, that? Your favorite junk food. You said my favorite junk food. Your favorite junk food. Fried chicken. All right. Okay, Julie. Cookies. Cookies. All right. Any specific kind of cookie? Oh, I like peanut butter and oatmeal raisin. Okay. All right. Good choice. Yeah. All right, Matt. So this was a Mike and Nights. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Jeff. Well, I'm bugging out on and off, but um, probably uh, peanuts. Is that a junk food? All right, we'll Those take that. Junk food, but yeah, I, okay, how about uh, peanut M&Ms? Okay, peanut M&Ms, all right, okay. That, that, that's a little better, yeah. <laughs> Whitney? Uh, probably sour cream and cheddar chips or really spicy food. I'm um, halfway through a pregnancy right now, so it's <laughs> hopping around. <laughs> awesome, treat yourself for sure. Um, okay, so what is one gardening technique that you swear by? Um, we'll start with Julie. An example would be like mulching or dripping. Uh, I'd, I'd say mulching for sure. Covering that soil is critical. And what kind of mulch do you use? Straw. Straw. Well, we, right. we also use a weed barrier too, just because okay. we don't want to be in the business of weeding all the time. But. Agreed, for sure. Uh, Matt, a gardening technique that you swear by? Oh, um, man, water. Water and essence of life. Perfect. Whitney? Um, everything they said, but I found what's been working because we have two sites, the orchard and the garden, is we have been digging like broken pieces of plates or pottery stuff, you know, you break a plate or whatever. And we've been using these um, paint markers and just writing like basil, you know, when you first plant and also a way to um, mark our gardener's beds because uh, we have raised beds uh, has just been, you know, like cues to care and a good way to remember. We try to do planting plans, but you know, it gets lost. So I just broken pieces of plates, paint markers, and it lasts more than a season. Genius. I like the props that you brought too. Good job. <laughs> um, Reggie, a gardening technique you swear by? Uh, composting has worked well for us. And I don't like to use for, uh, manure. So composting has been working very well. Very good. Classic, classic answer there. Jeff? Um, pitchfork for um, bed prep. It, it's just so easy to pull out large um, sections of soil and then be able to just knock out weeds and old plants and turn them over. And those beds tend not to be overwrought or overrun with weeds and unselected, you know, unwanted. So pitchfork. Nice. Pitchfork, all right. Um, okay, your most overrated vegetable, Matt. <laughs> Beets. <laughs> Julie? Carrots. Okay, overrated. All right, Jeff? Beans. Beans, okay. Pole beans, bush beans? Bush beans. Okay. <laughs> Whitney? I would say like iceberg lettuce, just for what it takes in nutrition. Yeah. Yeah, good answer. Reggie, most overrated veggie? <laughs> He's on a phone. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I would say pole beans because they're so stringy and unruly and they grow that. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Uh, a quick question from someone in the chat What size gardens do you work with? Um, so I know that that's kind of hard to, you know, throw out your square footage, but um, if you were to say the size of garden, roughly, Whitney, what would you say for Pendleton Heights? 
I actually know it's like 0.35 and an eight of an acre. Um, and we have 44 raised beds. And then uh, I would say half of that um, lot is uh, um, just people gardening in the ground. We have a lot of uh, refugees and immigrants and they prefer to uh, garden in the ground. And then we also have raspberries and blackberries that take up a good amount of space. And then our orchard that is behind me here, I think it's just, um, I think it's like around a sixth of an acre. All right, great, thank you. Um, Julie, how big is your garden? Can I just say large? <laughs> no, yes. I think we're probably close over an acre. Um, two thirds of it is 99 plots that we lease and a third of it is a donation garden. All right, Matt. All right, we got two raised beds at the uh, Jackson, uh, Jackson house out there at the um, uh, Jackson County Family Court. Uh, but I also uh, team up with um, some beautiful people uh, with the Greenwood Garden, which holds, uh, I believe, anywhere from like 20 to well, almost 20 raised beds out there uh, and, and several fruit and fruit trees and bush trees. Great. Jeff, the size of your garden? Uh, relatively small. We have uh, eight raised beds that are four by 12. Um, that's our primary plant. And then we have a ground run that's basically four or five by right below a retaining wall because we're on a slope. Um, so we have flat beds, um, the raised beds up on the upper tier. Um, that includes also um, a run of blackberries in a four by 24 and two bush cherries off on the perimeter. And then down below, we have ground bed that, like I said, right below a retaining wall that um, runs like five or so by 24, and then our six trees. So that's a pretty small little space, but um, we do okay. Great, and then Reggie, size of the garden? Those touch screens, you know? <laughs> He doesn't want to touch. Anyhow, uh, our garden is a third of an acre. We have 31 raised beds that we built, and uh, we put in the aisles between, you know, from the open spaces also. Awesome. Um, okay, last rapid fire question is, what is a gardening taboo thing that you do at your garden that you would not like to admit to everyone that please now admit to this group of lovely humans here joining today? Uh, Julie, can you start with that? <laughs> Gardening taboo. Uh, I don't know. Is like uh, the weed fabric we use. I think that's a big cheat. I mean, you should pull your weeds, right? So I think that if it works, it works, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Some examples but I'm thinking think of. a better one. Yeah, like what? for my personal garden would be, um, I, I do not water uh, as much as I should. So, you know, we set up all these cute little um, documents to you all being like, water this much and do this much. And I, I never follow that. That's my thing that I don't like to admit. Jeff, what about you? I'm going to go with the um, water and weed uh, consistently. Uh, we just have, um, we have no, um, hey, dog face. I'm in the middle of a meeting. I got a bu buddy with a, um, a happy hound. So, yeah, this is live, folks. This is what happens. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm not as consistent with watering and, and weeding um, as we should be. And that that has has cost us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about you, Reggie? Um... Over overseeding, <laughs> we plant too many plants, and then have to keep up with them, and it's not easy. <laughs> that's a good one for sure. That's a good one. What about you, Matt? My stock or organization needs help. <laughs> My stock is not up there when it comes to uh, those taller plants, those viney plants, and the organization around the stocks. I, I should I could definitely take more time with that. 
Very good. Whitney, what about you? <laughs> Everything everyone already said. And then I think just like, I will save seeds like crazy, especially with like, you know, tomatoes or uh, native flowers and um, trying to get better about like seed swaps. Cause like what ends up in my basement or the sheds is just, I mean, it's more than one person will ever need probably each year in a lifetime that's great okay thank you all hey, very can, much oh yeah go ahead can i, can I throw one more up because it's, it's probably <laughs> yeah the sin of the nature um matt's not on anymore is he he might be i'm not sure oh gosh i don't want to confess to him then <laughs> um it's pruning and spraying the orchard i just have been awful with it thanks for your honesty here <laughs> Yeah, so um, just as you all can see, just from the, the little bit that we've done so far, the idea of the panel is just to make you um, feel affirmed and that you're in the right place, is that we're all struggling with different things too. And then also just seeing the different types of community gardens that we have here too. We've got anywhere from Matt's two raised beds working with youth up to Julie's whatever, how many acres Julie just said, just huge garden. So um, everyone's doing different things, but everyone's got some um, insight to share. So um, thank you for sharing that too. So we're gonna move into the fishbowl. So um, I'm going to pose some more meaty questions um, to you five to discuss. Um, so let it be conversational, um, ask each other questions too, and please feel free to offer up a little bit more about your garden too. Um, so I think people just kind of wanna hear what other folks are doing. Um, so I will just pose this to the group and whoever would like to take it on first. Um, what do you wish you would have known in your first couple of years of gardening or running a community garden that you would like to maybe give that advice on to somebody, a new, a new garden coordinator? I'll, I'll start. Um, so we took it on ourselves to put this garden in. Um, we figured, you know, field of dreams, build it and they will come. Uh, they haven't come. <laughs> so build a, build a volunteer base um, early on and uh, get some understanding and expectations um, set up in advance because it is it takes a little time really should have some dedication on it I'll go next uh, I would say start small we didn't start small and there was a lot of struggles in fact uh, Bobby Wright who most of you probably know came out one Saturday and helped us to uh, basically till up the whole garden and make some in what I call ground raised beds, which is which has made us ex exponentially uh, more successful doing that. I think um, the other thing to remember when you start off is gardening is a very humbling activity, and you just need to to not be afraid to try stuff. You need to be patient. And you need to have perseverance because, you know, Jeff, you talk about building a volunteer base. You know, I've seen it. This is will be our 11th season and it, it's just one volunteer at a time. And it's, it's more of a job of how do you retain them and keep them happy. But um, I think the last thing I would say is to manage your garden to your volunteer base. Um, for example, we started using weed fabric because I didn't have a whole lot of volunteers. I didn't know who was going to show up. And um, I didn't want to be in the business of weeding all the time. I wanted to be get people excited about gardening. And um, in fact, that one of the early years, we ended up with a ton of cherry tomatoes and wouldn't recommend that if you don't have a lot of volunteers to pick those things. I can go next. Um, I think uh, I had quite a few, but like being honest with how much time you you want to commit because you can you can just give every single waking minute. It's easy. And um, I when I moved to the neighborhood, I was working from home, so it was like such a nice uh, socialization. But it also became you know too much. Um, so just being a, a, um, honest with how much time you actually want to be commit and uh, set that attention. And then ask for help. I was trying, I was digging around trying to find it, but um, I found help 
in so many different ways. So we have, it's an old neighborhood. It attracts a lot of architects. And so I got some architects to help um, design a lending library and signage board. And then we also had someone that actually drew out a really lovely plan of our garden and our orchard. So that made it so much easier in numbering all the little beds and just having a sign that I have laminated and I go out and I say, this is your bed. And now we have that posted on our sign board. And that's just like such an easy reference when people are out of town and they say, hey, can you like water my bed number 22 people will look at the map they go to that that has been oddly like one of those little game changers and um i found that really helpful and then a simple calendar that you can just refresh every year so like now we did a seed swap last year that i'll invite you all to like getting that on the calendar just your garden kickoff day um we uh have been really lucky to um have kansas city university in our neighborhood and they do two volunteer days that are really big and just getting that on the calendar getting organized and saying even if it's like that's when we're going to completely drag all our um compost out or we're going to mulch on that day and just um a simple calendar and if i can't do those days making sure i have people that can and then just um uh, expressing gratitude. I feel like that, that's one thing you see with movie stars that are really appreciative of their spouses. They start with that and they say, my spouse makes this possible and or whatever your support system is and just constantly expressing gratitude because it feels good, right? It feels good to express that gratitude and those people um, feel that too. And so during this kind of dormant season, we're, we're less busy just reaching out to people and saying, man, that was such a great year. Thank you so much. And especially in the pandemic when you're not seeing people as much. So that was my long-winded answer. <laughs> Recording in I'll go now. now. <laughs> um, one thing that I really wish we had done at the beginning was what Julie just, I mean, Whitney just said that she did, making the map, the drawing of the garden, laying it out and uh, putting their, the schedule of, of uh, labor and work and things that need to be done on a calendar so that I could free myself up because anytime one of the volunteers contacts me and they want to go work in the garden, I just about have to go and show them what to do. And another thing that I wish we had done was to make the classes, uh, to illustrate the need for them coming to our gardening classes so that they would already know what they need to do and they wouldn't even have to you know, ask me or require my presence there because our garden is too much for myself being 2,068 years old and my wife can handle by ourselves. <laughs> so uh, um, a proper planning and illustration would, would, would have gone a long way to help us be more successful and more timely with our activities. Oh, and I wish I had caught the leak in our water rain collection system before it killed our apple tree. So now I have to replace one of the apple trees because it got drowned. But I did get the leak fixed. Indeed, I guess I'll go next here. Um, and just to note, I am the green horn of green thumbs here, guys. So uh, I'm learning as I'm going away, taking a lot of notes. Um, one of the things that I think uh, would have definitely uh, resulted in a better harvest for me uh, starting out was really getting to know my grounds, right? Getting really getting in touch with that soil, uh, knowing what you're working with uh, and, and what may be harmful, you know, moving forward in terms of your weeds, what kind of weeds you're working with. And uh, some of the chemicals uh, within the, that soil. I think if I took uh, the time and effort and energy to really know, you know, my plant environment, uh, it probably would have resulted in uh, making better decisions on what type of plants, right, where to put them, and then the uh, ultimate, uh, the ultimate yield, increase yield. Great, thank you all so much. And I think I'm going to back up just a little bit too, just to offer the audience. Um, if you can just go around and talk about who you serve with your garden, um, so maybe how your garden is structured, just a small description of that and, and who you serve.
I'll go. We actually serve the surrounding community and uh, we, we, we have a school where we teach young people professional skills. And all the students in our school, it's about 50 of them or so, are required to participate in all the activities and learn as many different professional skills as they can while they're going to our school. And gardening is one of them. <laughs> so they are required to attend some of our classes, but they have, a lot of them have a problem with doing some of the work because most of them are teenagers or around between 15 and 21, 22 years old. However, my favorite students are the little children because it's, by the time I get through explaining something to them, they're already, they've already run out in the garden and gathered materials and they're already doing it. So those are our most enthusiastic and interested uh, participants is the little children between three and 12. And I love them and they get more work done than the older teenagers. <laughs> We've also had a, a request in the chat too, as you're describing that. Can you um, say the address of your garden as well so people can kind of orient themselves? Oh, yes, ma'am. Our, our, the address of our garden is at 1732 Quindaro. And my next project is to put up signage. So I got one of our uh, promising art students to is working on get, uh, making up some signs for us to put up there to mark the area. Perfect. Thank you, Reggie. In Kansas City, Kansas. Yes, ma'am. I can go next. Um, our community garden is at 2125 Mini Street. Uh, so we are in Kansas City, Missouri and in Pendleton Heights. And then the orchard is at uh, 21, uh, 2617 Lexington Avenue. And uh, we are right next to Kessler Park. And so Pendleton Heights neighborhood is actually has roughly 300 single family homes, but also the same amount of low income housing apartments. And then we really pushed uh, with the Paseo Gateway Grant, which was a HUD grant to have um, mixed income and in artist apartments. So uh, we are not a very big neighborhood, but we are densely populated and we are very um, mixed. Uh, um, it, diverse in incomes and ethnicities. And so we also have two elementary schools and a community center in um, Scuela Vida de Nova was like the 2019 charter school of the year. And so we have just really small and powerful organizations in our neighborhood and we mainly serve our community. It's hard to say with our orchard uh, specifically who we serve because we have, as you know, Kessler Park, a lot of um, homeless camps, transients, but that's part of our neighborhood, right? So um, we, we serve a lot of people and it's hard to measure exactly who benefits, uh, but we think it's a pretty wide range of people. Whitney, what was the street that your, your uh, garden is on? It's at Mini Street in Brooklyn. Um, so if you're ever over this way, PH Coffee is on Lexington and we're just a block south. So grab a coffee and come on down. Okay, thank you. I can go next. Uh, we're in Overland Park at roughly 135th and Quivira. We're on um, in a field south of the church. Um, we have rental beds and plots, probably have a community of about 70 people from the community at large. We're surrounded by a lot of apartment complexes and maintenance-free homes. Um, so we have a lot of those people. We also have um, a fairly large donation garden and we serve, our church has a pantry at 95th and Warnell. Um, and then also we send to Mission Southside, which they have a mobile food distribution out to South Olathe. And then if we have extra stuff, we try to get it out to whomever we can find. Um, we also have a preschool group that comes regularly that's, that's at the church. And we also have um, uh, a lot of school groups that come in the spring and the fall that help help it make it possible for what we do. So um, somebody asked, we're at Colonial Presbyterian Church.
I guess I'll step in here. Um, oh, okay. So I serve, um, well, all of my gardens that I work with all serve the community in which they're in. Um, the first one is the Jackson House, Haley, ja Haley Jackson House is uh, 2601 and 2602 uh, Gillum Road. We serve the com community in that area. Um, the Greenwood uh, Garden that we have is out at 7714 Prospect. Uh, the bigger garden I spoke, spoke about earlier, uh, that is also a garden that serves that community there, not sure residential area, and some uh, some commercial as well. Um, and then also I'm here now on location at another garden here for uh, that County Family Court, which is the one out at Hilltop. Uh, that's at 301 Northeast Gregory um, and in Lee Summit. And uh, we're getting ready to restart the uh, plant plans and, and get this thing going here, out here. So. And we serve the community out here in Lee Summit. All right. Um, so we're at uh, between the blocks of 8th and 9th Street, uh, uh, right on Benton Boulevard uh, in the north, historic Northeast. Um, the, the garden was um, part of a, kind of a campus beautification as we got a chance to rebuild the church um, building, uh, and it's affiliated with uh, the ministries Grace United Community Ministries, um, and it's kind of evolved from its inception uh, in the late uh, 90s when um, the denominations kind of pulled out of this area and left the church with our uh, late pastor, our namesake, uh, Reverend Sharon Garfield. So I'm with the Reverend Sharon Garfield Memorial Community Gardens and Orchard, and it's with uh, Grace United Community Ministries that she started. Um, she passed in um, 14, 2014. Um, our new directors kind of righted the ship because she was everything to everybody. And we're now very based in education. And um, as we got our campus rebuilt, got rid of an old uh, defunct car wash, which is now a playground and part of the orchard, uh, got rid of an apartment building that was on the corner, dilapidated, um, condemned. Um, so now our campus um, really runs from 9th to 8th, or 8th to 9th, right along Benton Boulevard. Um, pretty good swatch of, of uh, campus there. We serve the... Um, and, and the garden was designed to serve an educational purpose um, for the kids that we have um, in after school and tutoring, um, as well as the summer programs, particularly the summer programs, so they can have um, a sense of community and outside, outside activity, um, exercise, a chance to see that um, this the gardening concept is possible in their lives. Many of them uh, may never have any kind of concept of where things come from. Um, certainly have the fun of, um, you know, having their hands in the dirt and playing like kids should play. And then um, watching things come to uh, fruition uh, when they get the chance to pick. And um, it gives a, a chance for these kids to have an interaction and community of their own. So our produce, uh, First and foremost, we wanted to go to the kids. Um, they're fed during their sessions of after school and summer programs. So this fits right into the needs of the programs. Um, but their families, as they engage their families with what they're doing at the garden, um, again, a lot of this is concept because it's uh, hard to get it infused into our curriculum for those programs. And then um, a lot of our produce goes also to volunteers on site, um, crews that um, we get a chance to share some of these things with and that get them excited and pass the word. Um, our staff and then our food pantry, on site food pantry. And I know that some of our um, community meals have benefited from the garden. So um, I think that got everything. That's great. The same thing. No, that's great. Thank you guys. First, I just want to give you like a, a little round of applause that you're doing the Zoom um, sharing space and time very well here. I was imagining this to be much more awkward than it is. So that's all you guys. So good job on that. <laughs> um, the next question I want to pose to the group is, um, 
the three most important things, if you were to boil it down to a successful community garden, what have you found those three things to be? I'll go. One of the most important things is the, is the, the participation from the community or from whatever community you serve, just to get people in there. And you, like we try not to let anybody during the growing and harvesting season leave the garden without some kind of produce to take with them. It's not easy because everything, you know, there's some, sometimes like now where there's nothing that's right, actually growing or ripening. However, people love coming out to see that our garlic, as an example, grows during the winter time and they can actually see it because it starts, it sends up shoots and starts growing greenery before it gets too cold for it. So that fascinates people, but I can't just pull some up and give it to them right now because it's not ready. It was just planted uh, a couple of months ago. So uh, the, the communication and pulling people in, it's, it's not an easy task. However, we have to be persistent with it because that's what it's all about. You know, it, it's more about the people than it is the garden to me. People need to know how to grow their own food and people need to know about nutrition and health. So we tie those programs together and we do a lot. We talk about nutrition a lot in the garden because that gives people a tie to what we're doing. So again, that's the three things that you think um, successful to make a success, successful community garden. Uh, I'll give it a, I'll life. give it a shot um, to um, start your garden or at least get some good or, organic material in there. Um, the raised beds have just been extraordinarily successful because we brought in um, Missouri organic and, and, uh, and you got to be careful now. Um, it, it's a great growing space. So weeds love it too. Uh, so you got to stay ahead of those. But um, next, I would say um, really management of your resources. First, getting identifying your resources, your your finances, your water, your time, your volunteers. Um, really having a good grip on you know just the garden execution. Um, and with that, number three, um, make sure that your cloning machine works. Um, because you need time, 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 and more time um, really dedicated there. And that again is a resource that um, can be managed with a good uh, set of volunteers or community. Um, so I think that, that the people, 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 um, that's my number three or a good cloning machine. <laughs> I could go next. Um, I think there's four things, but probably the two top ones for me are the soil, taking care of the soil, because if we can't, if we don't take care of the soil, we can't grow anything. So, you know, just making sure that um, you're mending that soil and making it so it's um, fruitful for you. Um, the second one would be the people couldn't do anything without the people. And so I think, you know, the important thing is when you do get those volunteers to love them, love them by giving them vegetables, love them by educating them, love them by asking them to do things that maybe they've never done like haul manure. Um, but taking care of them and keeping them busy. I, I think the the thing that was most frustrating to me as a volunteer was getting someplace and not being kept busy. So I, I, I uh, hopefully I do a good job of keeping people busy when they come. Um, the third thing that has really helped us as an organization, because there's a lot of different pieces and parts to our garden, is we have a, what we call a steering committee and they meet once a month. And that's just, to me, a grounding group 
the people that sit on that are hold leadership positions within the garden and it just keeps us um, on track. And the last thing is the community connections. You know, I applaud KCCG for um, putting out a list of people that you can contact because there's, there's no better contact than a fellow gardener to one, be able to call up and say, hey, is your lettuce all bolted? Yeah, it has. So it just, it helps to have other people plus um, that, you know, just the knowledge. Every time I'm around other gardeners, I learn something. And then besides just Kansas City Community Gardens and a local extension office, um, community connections out there is very helpful to be able to ask questions or just to commiserate with somebody else. I can go next. I think if I did summarize, it's a lot of what everyone else said is community. So community in our gardeners, but community in our neighborhood. Um, our garden and orchard were both abandoned uh, infill lots. And those have come with interesting challenges like sinkholes and uh, pottery and bricks that, you know, from freeze and thaw. Um, but uh, our neighborhood is had a lot of interest. And so um, a lot of people are moving here and um, just involving your community and saying why this matters. And we uh, pre pandemic had a lot of events. So that's another thing is just kind of reminding people why it's important to educate people on how to grow food and uh, finding a space where people that live in the 6,000 square foot mansion get to interact with people that um, live in a, you know, studio apartment um, and they're artists and uh, a, a good kind of level playing ground. And then volunteers, like you said, we just, we have great volunteers that in Jerusalem Farm is just a really heavy hitting organization that we're so thankful to have in our neighborhood. And then I think what probably makes most of us good gardeners is patience. And so patience in, yeah, we have big dreams and goals on what you hope to happen, even in just like a volunteer day or what you wanna grow. But I found the pandemic to be a time where um, someone wrote about ghosted gardens where we didn't see or hear from people for a little while and you know they would respond and just being really patient and kind and how can I help and um, patient with you know just everything the mower breaks or uh, anything else I think those are kind of the key to uh, running a good garden is you're gonna have to tell people the same, this is how you turn the water on <laughs> and uh, this is how you access the shed, you know, four million times and that's okay. And I think just having that kind of um, patience and hopefully growing into some grace is uh, one thing I would say, you know, making the garden successful and trying to model that for other people. And they're like, that bed has weeds. Why don't we just pull it? It's like, it also has a lot of peanuts planted. Just give it a little time. <laughs> Indeed, thank you. Um, I guess I want to piggyback off of what Whitney said. I thought that was very important in terms of the patients. Uh, yeah. She's tapping into something uh, in terms of uh, I call it metaphysical or, or you know our mindset, right? Um, positive energy, positive attitude. Um, I once heard a, a elder of mine uh, say, you know, a great um, effort begins with a great mindset or great attitude. So me going into this thing, it's my first year doing this. And, and you know, we have, I got Shay coming around. He's like the garden czar. And, you know, he's with a lot of pressure on me. You know, I'm saying, <laughs> just playing Shay. <laughs> but no, um, but learning that every time I come to the bed, if I'm coming, whatever energy that I have with me, it seems to translate possibly into the soil and to the plant. Uh, my effort while I'm there on the bed, right? Pulling out those crazy vine weeds that we have here in Kansas City could take, uh, could take a toll on you, depending on how big your, bed, your beds are. And your mindset uh, could really affect the effort that you're putting into that, right? And of course, that ultimately affects uh, your harvest. So I think before... Uh, as, as everybody made some great uh, points in terms of how to make your guard successful, I believe it does start with a uh, great mindset, positive energy. And that's one, two, and three. <laughs> um, I gave one 
and I just talked about the people. Is it all right if I finish and give you two other things that are assets Please. in the goal? Please do. Okay. As we all know, water is extremely important. We were blessed by having a water system that was already set up, even though we did have to repair it. However, once we got it uh, uh, repaired and got it going, we, we got 2,500 gallons of uh, rainwater that we collect off of a flat roof next door. And I had to uh, go in and rebuild the water collection system, like the funnel that comes off the, the roof and the, and the pipe and it goes over to our tanks. And the manifold that go into the tank, you got to keep a sharp eye on that. This year, I'll be insulating it, <laughs> you know. But the I mean, however, the water and with it being rainwater, it's already pure. So that that was a beautiful thing. I didn't think about it because it was already there, even though I had to work on it. So water is extremely important, and you got to make sure that your collection system has enough to take care of your garden's needs. And uh, the other thing is that I kind of took for, I mean, I built a bunch of raised beds, which has helped tremendously in keeping the garden organized. And you have to pay attention to what plants you put in there. Cause I remember, I think it was Whitney or Ju Julie said that like the little cherry tomatoes, they, oh, <laughs> you Lord. expect something small and innocent and petite and those things get, they'll cover a 10 foot area real easy. <laughs> You know, if you don't trellis them or, or, or prop them up some kind of way, and we just put them in the ground and let them go crazy, and they ran all over each other, and we had to search for the tomatoes, <laughs> and it was a kajillion of them. We were <laughs> we were harvesting tomatoes all the way through, through half of November because it was a warm, you know, autumn season. So I think those are two other things that you know you have to pay attention to what plants you're putting in and know and read do your research and know what they're gonna cover and what they're gonna do before you plant them so they won't get out of hand. And of course, you can go into the soil. However, that was already taken care of before we got here too, because they had been spreading fertilizer on the soil and not using it. So <laughs> what we ended up with was Bermuda grass. And I'm reluctant to get rid of the Bermuda grass. I mean, we could smother it out with tarps. However, Bermuda grass, in researching that, that's a healing herb. So that's something that you actually want to take your shoes off and walk on because it will start working on healing your joints and your body. Even It even helps with arthritis. <laughs> and you can eat it. <laughs> it's the only grass I found that is edible. So I don't want to like get rid of it. I just one of the hardest things in the world to control because we had a Bermuda grass shoot grow through one of our potatoes. And I took pictures of it and it's becoming famous. <laughs> so, so that was it. I didn't know that about Bermuda grass. Great information. Uh, well, I wonder about how you discovered that about that Bermuda grass. I mean, it's got to be an interesting story about how you came up across understanding that Bermuda grass, unless you just did some research. I want to say it's some sort of personal story here. <laughs> Yeah, I did some research and that Bermuda grass is invasive. It grows, the roots grow down to six feet into the ground. So you, you have a hard time killing it. You'd have to actually put a tarp or something to stop the sun from getting to it over at least a three or four month period of time to kill it in an area. But then whatever, wherever it is still growing, if it's just in a little corner, it'll spread back over the whole, the whole area again. I mean, it gets into our raised beds and everything. And I'm a person who hates to weed. So I think that might be why some of my students avoid me. <laughs> I think next next winter, I'm thinking we're gonna go ahead. And once we get some of the insects out of the ground, next winter, I think I'm gonna go ahead and just cover the whole garden with tarps and start over. That's great advice. I know a ton of community gardens deal with Bermuda grass. So thank you for bringing that up too. Yes, um, Matt, I hear you might have to go, but thank you for joining us if you do have to jump off. We really appreciate your time. We know that you're actually planting right now and doing gardening stuff. So that's a great, a great reason to leave us. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. I'm learning so much and I'll definitely be in touch. Call me for the next one. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to give you one more question and then we're going to open it up to some of these other questions from um, the audience here. But um, kind of incorporating what some folks are asking is just um, how you engage your community 
So, I mean, there's so many different ways of doing it. And I think every garden sort of has the priority of engaging their local community, folks nearby, folks in the neighborhood. Um, so somebody in the chat asked about, um, do you use social media to do it? Do you use signage? What, what are some ways that you've found to be um, helpful in doing that? And this kind of is gonna go, we've got an Engage Your Community workshop coming up, a couple of them next week too. Um, so this will be great feedback for um, us to give on to folks too. So any advice that you have? That's actually something I'm still working on. I talk to everybody that I see. <laughs> I talk to everybody that I meet. I invite them out to the garden. Sometimes they show. However, whenever I go into a place where there's a group of people, I will like like when I go to my doctor's office. I spoke to them about what we were doing, and some of the people that actually worked in the office started bringing their children out. And then I tell them they have to stay because they have to know what we're doing with the children. And that way we know that we've got them backing up what, what the children are going home doing. Some of them have actually gone home and planted their little gardens. I, I actually went out to a couple of people's houses and built raised beds for them. And, and then they always come back and ask me to come back and check on them and see how they are doing. And that makes for a wonderful uh, interaction because Teresa and I enjoyed that too. And, and he, I think you just have to enjoy people period. However, we're working on setting up our signage, like I said before, and I'm scared to go on social media because then we would be at the garden all day, every day. <laughs> we do use social media quite a bit. Um, our Pendleton Heights neighborhood uh, is very much a DIY neighborhood and um, just kind of a lot of people bought old houses and aren't afraid to get their hands dirty, which is really lends well to a community garden, a community art orchard. And people just have incredible skill sets because our houses are so difficult um, and wonderful and beautiful. But um, so we do use social media. We have a lot of internal Facebook groups that are just really active and that's like an easy space, but that only gets to a certain population. Um, so like I said, we have a, a ton of kind of ref refugees, immigrants, um, primarily from uh, Vietnam and then like Kenya, South Sudan and um, Somalia. So we actually worked with a lot like Garfield Elementary and some other places to have children translate um, our just usual garden flyer into other language. Um, so Vietnamese, Somali, and uh, Spanish. And so did printed materials and kind of boots on the ground or did a ma mailer um, within the neighborhood. I am very lucky to have friends that are my neighbors that see my wild, crazy ideas and help. So Amy Strange, she works for Mid America Regional Council, does a lot of design work. I'm gonna share some signs that she's helped kind of create and just helps you know make events look really beautiful very simply and then um, Caitlin Dix is also a steward and she has a great uh, background with like bridging the gap and uh, water stream so just knowledge of people that are my friends that I like spending time with obviously and that are engaged um, <clears throat> But so, yeah, I would say uh, social media and physical signage. Um, I'm going to send some photos to the group chat. We, uh, the orchard is actually located on Parks and Rec land and they subcontract out things. So we mow and we take care of all of that. But some, for whatever reason, subcontractors will come along and they will spray. And we have put a lot of time and energy into creating pollinator beds and um, uh, apply for grants with Missouri Department of Conservation and going through a new round this because I wanna do less mowing and more growing and pollinators have um, just attracted wildlife and then therefore more, more people and it's been really great in that space. Um, so we have signage that says like do not mow, let it grow, let alone like this is our community garden, this is our community orchard. Um, but yeah, uh, we try to 
cover it all. But again, we're not a very large geographical area in Pendleton Heights. So we're lucky in that way. It's not that hard to uh, go into the local coffee shops, churches, whatever, and hand out a few flyers to um, hopefully get a more diverse population. Um, but I have found those uh, things have been really helpful with community engagement. And we just try to I do a lot less gardening than I had hoped, you know, once upon a time, but I spend more time kind of trying to get the word out to different organizations and even found like the Central Public Library. They have actually a little seed bank that I think the um, Kansas City Community Gardens, working with people like that, getting books. We have a lending library in our garden and just little things like that helps reach people um, in kind of a very, diverse group of people because it's different programs. Um, so yeah, social media printed and being present. I'll go next. Uh, community engagement. I think there's an outside component and an inside component to that. The outside, um, we've got a roadside banner. Um, that goes by a busy road. Um, we also use Facebook. Uh, we also have a garden brochure that we've used. Um, we've also had people like in neighborhoods where it's maintenance free who've talked to their neighbors and gotten people to like gardeners that way and volunteers. Um, but the apartment complexes, you know, if you've got extra produce, we've, um, We've gone over to apartment complexes about the time people get off work and given out free tomatoes, for example, just to let people know um, that we're over there and they can either come garden with us or come volunteer. Um, I also think there's a, there's a community inside the garden um, that helps us with word of mouth, for example, with our gardeners. Uh, I have a partner, Vicki Kuhn, who does an amazing job with the community garden people, just you know, uh, forming relationships with them, communicating with them, educating them. Um, and, and I think it's about how they feel when they come to your garden and that, that, that they share with those people then that they're in contact with. Um, as far as the volunteers, you know, always, so I, uh, Whitney, you said gratitude, always, I'm always thanking people as they're helping do stuff or um, as they're leaving for the day. Um, and, and I think part of that is we do volunteer for vegetables too, just we, we gross a lot of stuff for donation and we, we do have a you know, most people don't take very much, but at least it's something to give back to them for their efforts in our garden. Um, we have school groups that come, um, which probably is my favorite part. Reggie, sounds like you have a lot of fun with kids, just getting kids to see where their food comes from and digging and getting dirty and digging in the dirt and being outside. So I think that that's all I have. Yeah, Facebook, word of mouth, taking care of people. Well, I touched on ours a little bit that we're um, a campus with a ministry and that kids and families are involved. Um, I want to commend Whitney for now I understand why my um, local volunteers are um, uh, few and far between because of apparently running for governor is one of her strong points. So um, I'll be engaging, <laughs> I'll be engaging her quite a bit because um, we're we're literally neighbors. Um, but we our ministry um, at Grace United um, serves anywhere from you know three or four hundred families. Um, and Whitney alluded to Garfield. A lot of our kids come from there. Um, our tutors have indicated in their their backgrounds were in professional education, the testing, the aptitude testing and so forth. And they're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 some odd languages being spoken at Garfield. So, um, you know, we have, we have some really wonderful rich community to tap into. Um, 
kids from all over the world. Uh, they're excited to be there. They're engaging. Um, so our community is really kind of an on-campus community, and it's not. It was never our dream um, to stick to campus. We really wanted classes to take it out into the neighborhoods, empty lots, abandoned lots, uh, neighbor, neighborhood gardens that are just spread out all over and just be a resource there. Um, one of our biggest challenges in engaging the community is that I, I'm, I'm an outsider. I, I come in from OP uh, or Excelsior Springs where I have operations as well. You can kind of see it in the background here. Um, the old 10, 110 year old tin roof, uh, tin ceiling. It, it, so um, getting on campus is, uh, it's a half an hour no matter where I'm coming from. So time there uh, and having the community local um, cause it's, it's a hands-on, um, it's a hands-on thing. And when you can't be hands-on all the time, uh, it, the garden starts to suffer or, um, the, the structure of the organization that supports this, the, the organization. Um, so really, um, that, that's going to be our biggie this year is just building the allies and the resources. Uh, here we are in year five and still doing that. So um, engaging in community is probably, I mean, it's a community garden by nature and by name. Um, so really having the word go out um, anytime we have meals or, or families, uh, the kids are coming and going from um, our back parking lot, which is right on top of um, the garden. I mean, you have to drive around it and <laughs> it's visible. Um, highly visible and there's a lot of interest that way it's a matter of just kind of campaigning and having the conversations with people um, literally just one on one on one on one on one and just like, like you had when you get volunteers and they're engaged you just love them love them love them um, my one of my favorite conversations is uh, oh my gosh I can't believe how much you got done you are a rock star you are a superstar and you just keep that really uh, high-end energy and vibe um, coming from, you know, the stewards or leaders, and they know that you're, you're going to be there if you need to be there and that they're going to get what they need, guidance or, or you know, materials, um, water, whatever it is, um, and they're working hard. So uh, they always, they don't leave, volunteers don't leave. Uh, the garden or our structure, we have a lot of facility folks volunteering without something from the garden. So you just kind of spread the love. That's, that's our, that's our mantra anyway. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I feel like um, clearly every uh, garden coordinator out here knows that there's plenty of struggles in the garden in terms of not getting enough people out or weeds or pests or diseases or whatever. Um, but I really appreciate how all of you focused on some of the great pieces of it, of just at how so much of it is about people. Clearly we all wanna grow food for each other and to donate and to for our families, but it is really about people and building communities. So thank you for highlighting that. I really appreciate it. Um, so it's 11.48 right now. So we're gonna open it up to the Q and A portion here. Um, we will, um, if you feel like your question didn't get answered in the chat, feel free to go ahead and put it back in there. But if anybody wants to try out this um, fun Q&A thing that we're going to do. So again, um, at the bottom of your Zoom, you'll see a little emoji and it says reactions and you click that and then it says raise hand. So if anybody wants to ask a question out loud, um, we do ask, please keep it to like 15 seconds. That would be great um, just so we can make sure to get enough people um, answered and, um, and wrap up here. So yes, yeah, so we're going to go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Whitney. I saw the um, question from Veronica, and I want to just oh, yeah, please. answer that. Um, she said, I'm interested in how these diverse groups at your garden interact. Do you often see groups from different backgrounds sharing seeds, practices, other knowledge, also are plots free to use? Um, so I feel like the ties that I have found that bind are potatoes and tomatoes. So almost every culture that has come, you know, you know, every background from where they're from, um, tomatoes and potatoes are like a thing that everybody likes to grow as, as kind of staples. And language is sometimes a barrier, but, um, you know, 
when you're there and you're on site kind of just pointing and doing the best you can um, makes it possible, right? Um, and that's part of being present. And we, I haven't seen any conflict. I think it's just explaining. And um, I tried to share the signage, but uh, we created little signs that just have like a red X for when things are not ready. And then a green check mark for when things are, are. And we really tried to designate um, community beds that way. And then personal beds, we had people kind of decorate. So again, we used these little paint markers and I had some shingles that were painted left over from my house. And we just had people like decorate those, write their name and put it in the bed. And so people knew like, this is somebody's, I can't go and take produce from that. So just little simple kind of what I have heard other people call cues to care help when languages are barriers. Um, and definitely sharing the seeds. Uh, we have, like I said, that lending library that has a good door. People put stuff there and we have a kind of a harvest table where people put stuff. Um, we do ask for uh, donations um, to rent the beds where people can, but we also, um, will do, do, you know, we'll let people garden if they can't afford it. And it's 25 to $35. And that really just helps co cover our water costs for the year. And, um, we have other means we've done fundraisers. So this is going to seem, but we have like t-shirts that say Pendleton Heights community gardens. Um, and we sell those as a fundraiser and we did a hot dog fundraiser fundraiser and then right now I'm using this time to apply for some grants because we need to really redo our um, compost area it's on top of an alley so it's kind of dangerous and so <laughs> it's twofold we need it to make it uh, usable and it's part of an alley so we want to make it um, the lighting really good for our neighbors and just make it easier to use so we're uh, looking at different funding sources and I'm happy to share uh, what kind of grants we're going after here, because uh, there are a lot of good ones like Mid-America Regional Council has small grants for composting and that kind of thing up to $3,000. And for a lot of gardens, that'll do it. And then partner organizations like um, Missouri Organics, which is really close to our neighborhood, they love working with community gardens. They will donate mulch. You just have to fill out a form and they'll even deliver if you're within your radius. Um, and they've let us drop off uh, debris for free. So those are kind of, um, I hope, answering some of those questions that have come through. Thank you so much, Whitney. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of um, conversation in the chat about grant writing workshops, um, different recommendations for funding. So if anybody um, who's here and attending and knows of stuff and wants to throw it in the chat, please go ahead and do it. And I am taking note of that grant writing workshop. I think that's a great idea and something that KCCG can um, help offer to garden. So thank you. Um, I see that Chuck with Mitzvah Garden has his hand raised here. So Chuck, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and then whenever you're finished, just go ahead and mute yourself again and then lower your hand. Yeah, and I don't want to take up a lot of time because I realize that we're coming up to the end. I, I'm loving this, this exchange of ideas, because we're all doing this just for, for the love and passion of, of gardening and, and for providing food. I hear a lot of common threads, um, you know, and I just wanted to say um, what works, works. I mean, you know, Julie, you were talking about the challenge of volunteers, and I know you've come out to visit us and we visited you. And we, we, last year we tried no-till, was a disaster because of the lack of volunteers. And so we're gonna go back to hill and furrow and plastic mulch um, and using plastic mulching. And I'd, I'd love to talk about that, but my question goes back to um, uh, funding. And I guess, you know, there's a lot of questions about that. For us, the um, people are, I mean, it's easy to write a check. You know, people see what you're doing up there. We are interfaith, we're faith-based and, and people are more than willing to write a check. Um, but when it comes down to actually getting the labor, they're not so willing to really be out there in the middle of July and the hot sun is on your back. And, and I'm just wondering, just kind of general, um, right now is, is how are you funding your, your gardens? I mean, for us, 
we have the funding. We we could always use more, and I know we'll talk about that later. But but how are you paying for this stuff? I'll I'll throw it out there. Um, it 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 was our labor of love to put it in. Um, so it's one hundred percent funded by um, my sweetie and I. So uh, the water gets filled from our local um, parsonage building next door for the tank. Got a ton of help in startup. Um, and obviously the affordability of seeds, plants, plantings and so forth from KCCG. Um, and a, a few that have just kind of came with goods. So um, yeah, the funding is in house, but we're very small garden, so it's, it's really quite affordable. A couple grants, but that was early on. It was two, three, four years ago. I'll speak to our funding. Um, we survive on uh, the plots that we lease every year. Um, that's a portion of it. We also do two fundraisers. Um, in January, we're, get, we're getting ready to have what we call our bake sale, but it's really more than a bake sale. I mean, people provide um, preserved items like jams and jellies, uh, homemade salsa. Um, I mean, it's it's a lot of homemade things, um, and that and and we do that at our church. And I just have to say that our church is very, very generous because the, those, believe it or not, gen, that generates a lot for us. As well as in late or late July, early August, we do a produce sale, and then we've also been the bene beneficiary of some grants. Um, that have helped us to, you know, to do bigger things out in the garden. Uh, I'll go now. Um, our funding mostly come, well, it, it started off coming from what Teresa and I had saved, my wife and I had saved. Then uh, the Community House of Wellness started kicking in a little bit here and there. And we did get a, a nice uh, a nice grant to get some soil from Anna and the KCCG. That was a big help when we needed some soil to fill our raised beds that we were building. And just from talking to people in the community, we've been given things like we got some wood to build the raised beds with for 85% off. So a lot of wood costs us just a little bit of money. So we built 25 uh, raised beds to add to our garden the first year we, we took it over. Uh, and a lot of it is in people seeing that we're willing to do the work and they want to contribute. So we just, if they can't come and put hands on, like let them write a check. Uh, we do have products like we have 11, 1186 artesian water and we have a coffee called a taste of love coffee that's being sold from our bakery. And some of our students go out and sell food from the restaurant that we're, that we're teaching them how to run a restaurant business. So they go out and sell food from the restaurant. And a lot of that money goes toward the remodeling of the community house of wellness. So we're at the small end of the funds. However, a lot of things we, we are learning to do for ourselves by building it with our own two hands. So that goes a long way. You know, and it gives me other things to teach to the children when they see that uh, they can maintain and they can do for themselves a lot of things that people sit and watch people on television do. So it, it adds to our ingenuity and keeps us moving forward. I'm just glad seeds don't cost a lot. Especially at KCCG, right? <laughs> um, well, thank you, everyone.